then the soul piece in terms of how you do the work that you're meant to do that lights your soul on fire. And it all taps into your intuition and your trust in yourself and in the universe. And kind of the glue that holds it all together is love. Because changing your relationship with money is not something that happens overnight. It requires a lot of self-compassion, a lot of self-love, and a tremendous belief in yourself that you have what it takes to change the story. I think you're really going to enjoy today's episode with my good friend and certified money coach, Jenny Carlson, founder of Financials for Creatives. She's also the creator behind the Money Compass Deck, a practical tool that allows you to connect with the energy of money. Be sure to stay tuned in to the end when Jenny offers a powerful reading for you as a listener of the show. Jenny teaches creative women entrepreneurs how to trust themselves and feel confident in managing their money. She founded Financials for Creatives to offer a holistic coaching program that combines practical, emotional, behavioral, and spiritual tools to help women gain confidence and the know-how to manage the ebbs and flows of being an entrepreneur. There's a little something for everyone today, whether you're a woman in business, a mother establishing new money beliefs for your children, or simply reframing the narrative of your own money story, I'm certain you will have some actionable takeaways along with a few laughs. Enjoy today's episode with my good friend, Jenny Carlson. I thought a good place to start was this excerpt from Money Magic that I actually really love. This Mm. is a short paragraph. And I'm curious if you recommend this book to all of your clients, like, is it a prerequisite? or just a recommendation? The the first three chapters is a prerequisite as part of the core process that I do to kind of get a better idea of the archetypes I work with. So it was written by the founder of the Money Coaching Institute, Deborah Price, who developed the archetypes. So it's kind of to give a little bit of a a backstory or a reference point as we delve deeper into the archetypes as part of that process. Yeah, it's a great book and it's such a short read that it's really easily digestible. Um, I've read it now, I think three times. Just because wow. it's so interesting. Yeah, well, it's interesting when you read books, you take away things from them differently each time. And uh, there's a couple books like that that I have read a couple times and I'm just like, oh, I didn't see that the first time I read it or I didn't hear it that way the first time I read it, you know. So I'm going to start with a quick paragraph from the introduction of the book on exploring our relationship to money. She says, money possesses an energy and life of its own. It contains a duality similar to that present of our own nature. It is both spiritual and material, creative and destructive loving, and cruel. It can help us fulfill our greatest dreams or cause us to be defeated by our worst nightmares. Money is perhaps God's grandest experiment, for we have given money such power that it permeates every part of our existence. It is more than a means of exchange. It has become our other life. And all too often, it is the life we pay the greatest attention and tribute to at the expense of experiencing the richness that lies within our unexplored potential. It's wow. so powerful. It gives me chills every time I read it. It really um, is. So much value we place on money. And we're all poorly managing our money. And it has so much power over us. And I think because a lot of the behavior is so unconscious, we have no awareness of what's going on with our money. So I'm hoping today's conversation, we can shed some light Um, on those unconscious behaviors and help people start to unravel it a little bit for themselves. Yeah, Um, for sure. And and the tricky part with unconscious behaviors are that they are our beliefs and our thoughts, what we say about money, how we then behave and feel about money, even that it's unconscious, is that we're not aware of them. Some of those beliefs and things we say aren't even our own. Some of the language comes from our parents, how they managed money, or whether it was something that was never even talked about. 
and um, some of it is transgenerational that has been passed on for several generations. And so we might not even be aware of how far back those scarcity mindset or restlessness, whatever it is, comes into play because it's it's been an undercurrent for so long until you shed light on it and decide that this is no longer sustainable. There has to be a different way to engage with money and feel about money and to be in control instead of being controlled. So much of our mindset is created so young. Um, and I think this is a conversation we're hearing more and more about. There's a lot of awareness around that. So what would be like a step one for someone who is ready to kind of take a little charge of their money? What kind of practices do you share with people that they could do to start opening up to their money story and bringing some of these beliefs to the surface? So one thing I'm always curious about is if you go back and you think about money as a child, can you identify your first money memory or just a general energy around it? Was money something that you viewed as a positive entity, something you wanted more of? Or was it something that caused a lot of conflict? So internally, you you have grown to want to, to repel it. So if you can look with curiosity whether you have carried this feeling with you for a long, long time of it being something you want more of or something you don't want to engage in, that's, that's something that you can look at. But then also try to slow down and witness how you talk about money. That's right. where it becomes so individual. And it can either be something that empowers you or it can be something that disempowers you. If you have that voice as you've internalized it as your own or that you hear it from someone else and it holds you back instead of moving forward on your own path. So that's the awareness piece of it. But there's also the practical piece, just sitting down and getting a really good view of what's going on. Like, can you open your bank account or your bank statements and look at them? Or is there a form of fear that comes up around opening and looking that prevents you from doing that? Just that small action can tell you volumes of how you feel about money. I want to go back to the awareness for a minute. I have my own money stories. And of course, I always knew I was going to be an entrepreneur. I knew that very, very young. Mm -hmm. And I would talk about it a lot. And I would always hear, you know, oh, it takes money to make money. And just conflict with money in general, being raised in an environment where there was never enough, right? What really brought a lot of that to the surface for me was having my own children and back to how it's it's so set in unconsciously is I would become aware of it in how I would talk about money with my kids and I would recognize yeah. some of the same things coming out maybe not verbatim but in some ways I would be saying well we don't yeah I'm really mindful about how when they ask for something um we don't have the money for that right now, or that's too expensive. Mm. I try to not use terms like that. I, I will say things like that is not um, a priority for us right now, or um, let's put it on a list and let's get through the week because we have, you know, we just celebrated my my daughter's birthday. So it was, you know, we're, we're doing a lot for your birthday. So that's our priority this week is we're making sure that we have, you know, the cake, the venue. Yeah. The gifts, you know, and then next week, let's revisit this conversation. So just not cutting them off. Like we don't have the money for that moving on. Right. But more. Okay. I hear what you're saying is important and let's look at it. But right now it's not our priority. I have to say having kids has been my biggest awakening. Right. 
because <laughs> it's brought in so much to the surface on how I want to parent and raise them. And money yeah. is certainly, you know, not left out. Um, so those are some ways in which I'm aware. But you catch yourself yeah. saying things that you like, oh, wait, let's take that back, you know. And even if you do, even if you say something, if you have the awareness a day later, I think there's nothing wrong with going back to the conversation and say, you know what? I kind of dismissed you when you asked for X, Y, Z. But let's talk about it, you know. Um, that I've certainly done, too. That's beautiful. And I think whether you're having that conversation with kids, that's a conversation as adults we need to have with ourselves around how we spend money and how we prioritize money. There's a quote, but I don't remember it verbatim, but basically show me where you spend your money and I'll tell you where your priorities are. So mm -hmm. um, unfortunately, I don't remember who originally said that, <laughs> but it's also one of the philosophies behind one of my favorite softwares, You Need a Budget, which is mm -hmm. an opportunity to prioritize where money goes. But yeah. what you're saying too is so beautiful how you've been able to change the narrative around money with your kids and you get to embody that and show them how it can be different, you know? Yeah. I'm at the same time kind of reparenting myself because I'm not perfect. Mm -hmm. I still have a lot of unconscious spending behaviors. Um, you know this about me. I have some of those full tendencies, which are one of the money archetypes that you teach. And that full gets the best of me sometimes, you know? When I want it, I get it. And I'm, I'm the money manager. So yeah. a lot of times... <laughs> I pull the trigger when I shouldn't. And then, you know, an hour later, I'm telling somebody else they can't because we have to prioritize, <laughs> you know, it gets the best of you. And again, that's another unconscious behavior, you know? Yes. Yes. And I feel like, you know, my fool comes out every once in a while, too. And I have a very strong warrior archetype, which is very goal oriented and disciplined and discerning. Um, that's like my foundation, but I've noticed, especially with motherhood, that the fool comes out more frequently. And I don't know if it has to do with, um, you know, the fool has a tendency to have a bit of restlessness and it can be when we don't have enough time to ourselves and it's late at night or on the weekend and things slow down. And you don't know uh, how to fill that time once you finally have it. Or there are fires to be put out. So you, you think that it has to be taken care of now. That's also a classic behavior of the fool. The living for today. Mm -hmm. Instead of slowing down, looking at your bank account. Can you afford it? Does it have to happen now? Or could you wait a week? those sorts of things. But with kids, you want to give them everything, but there has to be boundaries around it too. But there's, as you say, a tremendous learning in that situation of caring for another human and taking care of their needs and taking care of your needs. Maybe you feel like you haven't taken care of yourself enough so then that's where the fool comes in too. The fool wants to buy something to have a a short-term dopamine hit to feel happy. <laughs> and, you know, it, that never lasts very long. So it's kind of an invitation too to see how we can be happy and find contentment without spending. Yeah, you mentioned boredom being a really big trigger for unconscious yeah. spending. I think boredom and not feeling enough as mm -hmm. if, you know, something needs to be changed or fixed. And that then translates into that restlessness that presses by and thinks this is going to be the thing that solves everything. Yeah. So you mentioned some practical steps that people can take outside of the awareness piece. 
what kind of practice are these mindfulness practices? Are they, you know, I call them gritty practices where you're really digging into the, to the stuff. What can you share? Yeah. So there are several different practices. If you're finding that you have a lot of anxiety come up, just engaging with money, you know, that anxious energy needs to move. And something that I like to always recommend then is to go out for a walk, go out in nature. Don't listen to a podcast or an audiobook. Like, don't fill yourself with more information and noise, but rather find it as a way to move that energy in your body and hear the sounds around you as a way of just getting grounded and breathing and you know a walk solves so many problems just like you know <laughs> standing in the shower does too but it's a lot easier than to come back with a clear head and sit down and say okay let's look at this now mm -hmm. that's one thing that is really important but then you have to know what your priorities are like you want to spend your money going places is travel something that is important to you is it experiences if it's experience based then you have to make sure that money is allocated for those things and maybe it's experiences is to, to experience new cultures new foods music whatever it is that lights you up that has to have room in the way that you direct money. But on a foundational level, the thing that will give you the most inner peace is to basically print out your bank statements or just open up the bank account and look where money goes out. When does money come in? When does money go out? how much is going out when to all these different recurring bills that we have just like the you know the heart has a certain rhythm our breath has a certain rhythm there are so many different rhythms that we have internally and money also have a rhythm in our life if you divide it into looking at the first two weeks of the month versus the 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 final two weeks, they have different patterns. The more so you true. get engaged with knowing the rhythm of the, those recurring patterns, the more you can be in control. Um, I was thinking this morning when I was driving my son to daycare that if someone woke me up in the middle of the night and said, when is your mortgage payment due or when is the phone bill due? I'd be able to, you know, in my half sleep, be able to say the, the exact date. And that is something that gives me a sense of control, that I know when money needs to be available. And if something change, that's the beauty when you have that kind of structure, that it's not set in stone. You, you tap into the rhythm so that when the changes occur, you can tweak it. If you've allocated a certain amount to eating out, but something else comes up, then you can move that money around to where it needs to go to make everything flow. So that's why we can never just set it and forget it. We have to constantly be engaged with it. So if you know your recurring expenses, that's like the most telling piece in what needs to be available each month just to cover those. But then you have groceries and eating out are generally the big ones. The gas bill, electricity, those are a lot in flux these days. But <laughs> also fuel prices, those are variable. But if you can tap into the rhythm of those two, anything that is variable, you can make them controlled by looking at maybe a six months or 12 months of spending to see 
how can you then turn that into an average or, you know, gather the information so that you have awareness around what's been happening for us, for example, we barely used our cars when we were in the middle of the pandemic, but now both cars are being used so much that, you know, fuel costs have gone up quite a lot. And it's really important to be aware of that because then it, it gives you a peace of mind knowing that you have it covered. It's a great point. Just being more conscious of where the money's going. I think a lot of people can relate to bill pay and the anxiety that that generates when you sit down to pay. I mean, I don't know. I, I feel like a lot of people don't even balance checkbooks today. That is something yeah. I still do. Now, I have moved it to a more digital platform. I have a spreadsheet that acts as my checkbook. But the idea of money coming in, you sit down to pay your bills on payday and the money goes right back out. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of people can't bear to experience that every two weeks or monthly or whatever it is that they do it. So I think a lot of people don't even pay attention to it. So three things I've implemented since working with you, Jenny. One, I take a pulse about every four months. And I will, so what I'll do is exactly what you were just talking about. I'll kind of average some things out and say, okay, gas for the last four months was about this. Um, groceries for the last four months, which keeps going up and up and up. <laughs> yes. These grocery bills, I don't even know what's happening. Um, you know, I was just talking to my sister-in-law the other day and she was, she was like, like, I spent $4 on celery. Like that, what the <laughs> hell am I spending $4 on celery for? I'm like, I know it's like water. Like, this is insane. So. Pulsing it every four months, just kind of getting that average, you know, your, the things, your fixed expenses, like you were saying, they don't really change, but yeah. um, those other things, especially in today's economy are changing every day. Um, what was the other thing? So a spreadsheet, my, my balance sheet, I have color coded it in a way that helps lessen my anxiety. And I've actually put little affirmations. And so for the fixed expenses, I went red, yellow, green, and mm. based off of the expenses, whether they're credit card bills, auto payments, mortgage, which ones give me the most anxiety? Those are red. Okay. So probably in my case, the two credit cards are like, they're red and they give me the most anxiety, but I have a little message yeah. there next to that saying, um, you know, there is nothing wrong with debt, but if yours feels like a heavy burden then your vibration around money is of resistance. And when that burden is lifted, your resistance lifts as well. So I just have this little reminder that like, okay, it feels heavy in this moment, but we're working at it. You know, we're going to pay a little bit more than the minimum this month. And like, this is where my focus is, is on paying down these. So I actually, I know there's a lot of advice out there about how you pay down debt, but um, I basically work on which one's giving me the most anxiety right now. Mm -hmm. and that's where I'm going to focus it because I know once I can release some of that resistance, then that's going to open me up a little bit more to less of it. So that's how I've done it. Credit cards are red and then car payments got yellow, but then like the mortgage is a green, like it's my mortgage. I know I'm going to have it for a long time. I don't got to think about it. Like it is what yeah. it is, you know? Um, so that's how I've prioritized it. So color coding, and I used to write in a calendar on paper, all of my bill dates and their due dates. And I've moved that to an online calendar with color coding as well. And it allows me to see exactly what you're talking about. If someone were to ask you, when is your cell phone bill deducted? You know. And so seeing yep. that every month allows me to know. But what's interesting since I did that was now I have all of this new color and I'm like, ew, I have a lot of expenses on this calendar that I don't really want. Like, and it's all the things. It's not just the bills. It's the Spotify, the Netflix, the, you know, I have them all on there. And so my goal now is to minimize those. Mm -hmm. I feel like I see it in a whole different light now that it's color coded. Yes. So those are the three things I've implemented. As I was going to ask you as part of those check-ins of every four months, do you then evaluate those subscriptions too, which you've been using or have you not used them as much as you thought you would? And can you use that as an opportunity to cancel them and direct more money into savings or investments or to increase that snowball 
to make the the credit card go away. Yeah, a hundred percent. One example I have is we were subscribed to Sling, and I was like to my husband, "When is the last time? Like, you keep Sling for one channel, the History uh-huh. Channel." I'm like, can't you? It's for one episode. He watches Oak Island. He loves it. He's obsessed uh-huh. with it. But it's like his show. That's all he watches. And football, you know, he's a sports guy. So sports and Oak Island. And so I said to him, I'm like, can we cancel Sling? Like, can't you just watch Oak Island on your phone? I think it's free on the History <laughs> Channel. You know, and I, I don't want to pay $40 a month for one subscription. So yeah, I mean, it's a great way to reevaluate and think, you know, are, do we really need this? No, not for one show. No. Yeah. Yeah. Subscriptions. I mean, pretty much everything is subscription based today and it can be such a money leak. It builds up really quickly. And uh, even though you might get a better deal if you go into an annual plan, I've started to do more of my subscriptions monthly just so that I can have an opportunity to cancel it if I see that it was something that happened in the spur of a moment, but then I fall off the wagon and then I can release and say, I guess I was trying to do too many things at once. So I'm going to release this one <laughs> and know that you can always resubscribe and give it another go. Right. Another thing you talk about is people having a hard time holding on to their money. And I think that kind of speaks a little bit about what I was saying. We see the money come in and then it just goes right back out. Anything you want to say around that? Yeah. Um, Problem is with a lot of spending is that it's fun to spend and it's not as fun to save. And (laughs) in order to build a muscle that you may have never built before or that wasn't modeled to you, you have to find a way to make saving at least equally as fun as spending money. To build up that muscle of not needing an instant gratification, but that we can wait for good things to come and that there's a sense of safety in holding on to money. I see in a lot of the work that I do, entrepreneurs have grown so accustomed to stand really close on the edge that getting a rush whenever money comes in and still make it. But they've never experienced what it feels like to have a sense of safety and security. So it almost feels safer to be on the edge. So then you have to learn how to practice and hold on to money to walk yourself off of that edge. Even if you start with $1 going into a separate bank account. If it's at a separate bank, even better, because then it's harder to transfer it at the spur of a moment. Mm -hmm. But just building it as a habit and a practice of taking care of money and wanting to see it grow. One thing that I'm very grateful to my parents for is that they taught me from a very young age to enjoy saving. Um, We had a a bank account in one of the banks in Sweden where if you opened an account then you're part of this like million crown lottery once a year or something so someone could win a million crowns Uh, and then I think you had an extra chance or something when it was your birthday and that was such a cool incentive for me I loved Knowing that there was a chance to win something and in the meantime to put money into the bank account and identify what it was that I wanted to save up for and buy. Um, We did a lot of chores. I grew up, we had a dairy farm and a potato farm, so there were plenty of (laughs) chores to do. And I was taught how to handle money from a very young age and to then use money to buy the things I wanted that's something I want to instill in my son too that it's fun to save and that it gives you autonomy and freedom that you can have something to look forward to it's powerful 
when you kind of figure out that you can hold on to it, that you don't have to be controlled by money or how it flows and all the external factors, but you actually have an opportunity to shift that around. And that's where I come in, <laughs> in my job as a strategist, because I help my clients figure out how to pay off debt faster and save more or redirect money and come up with a plan so that money can be held on to and serve in a way that benefits future you. I loved what you said about creating an incentive for saving money because I think a lot of people do live in the moment and they really struggle with saving. And a lot of people are living on tight budgets. You know, they're month to month. Yeah. There's no room for saving. And that's that's tough. I've certainly been there. And I go back and forth to that place. Um, yeah. It reminds me, the kids have, it's called Fund My Future. And it's a program for kids that as long as you make one deposit into your kid's bank account every month, you're entered into, they do multiple. There's like 10 $50 winners and there's like a grand prize of like a thousand dollar winner every uh -huh. month like that's so awesome now it's on me the kids don't know much about it I started it when they were really young but every time that text message comes through as a reminder it's like oh yeah it, it just has to be a dollar it doesn't even have to be some astronomical <laughs> amount but yeah it does it creates this like oh I gotta do that I gotta make my deposit that's a great incentive. And it's interesting with kids. I feel like kids and money could be a whole conversation oh, for yeah. a whole other episode. <laughs> but interestingly, both of my kids are very different. My son is, I guess he's a saver, but it gives him a lot of anxiety when he wants to spend it. But he's like, I don't know. I feel like if I buy this, maybe it's going to not be as great as I thought it was going to be. Like he's aware of mm. the energy of money and, and that he might not be satisfied with his purchase. So does he really want to spend his money on that? So he's very analytical when it comes to money. And my daughter, she could care less. She is spending it all. If you give her 50 bucks, she spent 55. If she spends beyond. And she just doesn't care. But you know what's interesting about her is that she's a money magnet. This girl finds money everywhere we go. I love and it. And she don't care. It's a penny and she is overjoyed that she found a penny. I mean, it's just so funny to watch them when it comes to their money. So I can see even as adults, how differently we all think about money and spend our money and save our oh, money. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot. I mean, I love that your daughter finds money and <laughs> it, that's such evidence that she thinks positive thoughts and has gratitude. I find the same if I'm out walking the dog and my mind goes to positive places of gratitude, suddenly money shows up in the sidewalk. So keep yeah. encouraging that. And <laughs> with your son too, that's something that a lot of adults struggle with. And uh, that's where the, that sense of control comes in, in terms of if it never feels enough. So one way that you can help him is to look at what is enough and to cultivate that money magician in trusting that more money will come, that mm -hmm. if he makes a purchase that he's not satisfied with either, he can sell it and recoup some of it, or he can do more research next time. I find a lot of the pleasure in buying comes from doing the research and mm -hmm. learning about something. I can see too, now this wasn't planned to be an episode around our kids, but <laughs> <laughs> they do show how we talk and how, how we view money. But my son, he's in a phase where he loves berries, all the berries. And sometimes we, I have to cut him off. We have to save some for tomorrow <laughs> or we're out of them. And I have found that I've used the excuse that we're out or that we need to buy them. So now he is the one who says, oh, mama, köpa. Köpa means buy in Swedish. So I was like, yes, we have to go to the store and buy more. But then I'm like, hmm, the money coach in me just thinks about 
how long is that sustainable to to say or should I be saying it a different way and uh yeah they it brings up a lot of things that we're not aware of so one thing I've done with my son to help him is we looked at his room from a feng shui perspective so in feng shui we work a lot with money I would say top three reasons people seek a consultation is money, love, and health or wellness. Those are the three biggies. But one of the tools we use is called a Bagua map. And it's basically just an energetic map of a floor plan. And so you can place this map over your, if you were kind of looking down at your home and from an aerial view, your money corner, um, which is, is in the back far left corner, if you were standing at the front of your home at the front door. Mm -hmm. Now you can do that for the whole main floor or upper floor of a home, or you can also apply it to a room. And so we applied it to his bedroom alone. And so some of the things we did was just because he has more of like a scarcity money mindset, he doesn't want to like lose his money or be disappointed with the money he spent is we moved his piggy bank to his wealth corner. So the back left corner, he has his piggy bank there. And we just kind of do that intentionally that, you know, more money is always going to come into the piggy bank, right? Um, so I that's, that. yeah, but if you wanted to apply it to your main floor or whatever, you just look for that far left corner of your space again, as if you were standing in the front door. And one of the first things we recommend is kind of similar to what you do with your clients is you kind of bring all the gunk to the surface, right? You really mm -hmm. got to dig deep into the money story, but in a home space, ours is okay. Is it filled with clutter? Is it clean? What needs cleaned up? What needs brought right. to the surface? My money corner is my kitchen. So just constantly going through the kitchen and the pantry and the drawers and just making sure things are wiped down and wiping down the windows because windows represent the eyes of the home. So do we have clarity? You want more clarity in your, in your spending or your income. Um, so you're cleaning with intention. If you're trying to increase your income, for example, maybe place a plant. Plants represent that wood energy. And so good plants would be like snake plants or aloe, something that is like upward mm. rising, like some sort of plant in that fashion. Um, so these are all just some tools we use in feng shui in bringing some more awareness to money issues. I love that. And uh, I hadn't thought of the snake plant as a, a money plant. I'm familiar with the pilea who has round leaves and there's another money tree but i like mm -hmm. the visualization of some something reaching for the sky yeah, yeah. in in yeah, my home too one, it's too. It, the the kitchen is would be our money corner too so <laughs> i have some windows to clean and <laughs> yeah that's a big one and water too water is very representative of money you hear it in metaphors you know money going down the drain or money going out the window like we just mentioned the windows so bathrooms are usually not like a great place for the money corner so if your bathroom or even just a powder room sits in your money corner just being um aware of that just keeping the door closed the toilet lid of course stays down regardless of where <laughs> your bathroom is because even though water represents money because we like the flow of it in our lives uh -huh. But in a bathroom situation, it's draining, right? Everything's going out of the house. So it's draining energy. It's kind of like the opposite of what we want. So keeping the toilets down, keeping the doors closed, balancing with it with some more fire energy, tying red ribbon on the outgoing drains, um, that helps balance that water energy too. So the red being that of fire. And the ribbon is not stopping your water from going up. It's just a reminder every time you walk into your bathroom you see the red ribbon it's a subconscious reminder check your money so kitchen and bathroom are both in our <laughs> money <laughs> corner <laughs> and yeah. it's it's giving new meaning to having a, a baby proofed toilet lid <laughs> to making sure that it's tight and locked down yeah well my son's 10 so that's the toilet seat down is a constant struggle in my house too uh, so the ribbon around the pipe could be an amazing ritual to do at the beginning of the year or any time of the year, but anything that you can do practically like that is yeah. such a beautiful reminder. And 
you've talked about in the past too, to stop leaks. And we had a dripping kitchen faucet. And eventually I was like, can we please change this faucet? <laughs> you know, it's not just the knowing it, from a feng shui perspective that that is a money leak, but it makes you feel so out of control when you can't yes. close a faucet. And that's how money feels a lot of time when it controls us versus we're in control. So I love how that can just create a shift or a reminder in your relationship with money. Yeah, that's such a great analogy. It's just constant drip, drip of water, yeah. drip of money, it's just with every drop. Bye bye. There's a dollar. Yeah. You can start looking at it that way, you know, dollar down the drain every time that drips, fixture leaks, plumbing leaks are never great. The kitchen is such a good example. When our cabinets and our counters get really cluttered, it's so much harder to find stuff. It's harder to cook and it causes so much stress and tension just to be able to do what we need to do. And it's the same with money. If you operate a business, you don't want to commingle your finances. You want to have clear boundaries and separate bank accounts for business versus personal. You want to have easy, manageable systems to look at your money and to get an overview versus if receipts pile up and there's no record keeping and it's been nine months since you last got expenses into a spreadsheet mm -hmm. or a bookkeeping system so you're not able to see how profitable the business is and then you're not able to have clarity around how much you have to save for taxes or how much you can pay yourself it's that fogginess because we let clutter build up that makes it so much harder to be in a good relationship with money yeah. Yeah. And for you know, entrepreneurs, since we're speaking to it, you can even look at the feng shui of your office. If you have a home office, or even if you don't, if you're in some office building, again, standing in the doorway of your office, the back left corner is going to be your money corner of that space in particular. Um, you can look at the corner, you could look at the room as a whole, you know, or I know a lot of practitioners will even feng shui their desk as they're sitting at their desk. The far left corner of their desk is they're money corners. So what can you set there as you're working to remind you of tracking your expenses or getting better at managing your bookkeeping? Or is it something you need to outsource? Do you need to sit down and look at where things are going just for a week and say, okay, I can actually afford to outsource this? Um, yeah. A lot of people don't even realize what they can actually outsource. That's a huge thing for entrepreneurs yeah. is they don't think they can, but if you're not taking the time to think about it. Yeah. I mean, most of the time as entrepreneurs, we have to figure out what it is that is actually in our zone of genius and that will make you money versus the tasks that can usually be outsourced are not the money makers. But there's always this uh, fear of giving up control that can mm -hmm. someone else do it as good as I can is something I hear from yeah. a lot of creative entrepreneurs. But that then fills the plate with tasks. They, you know, send it to someone else and go out and, you know, do another interior design job or another portrait session. Like when you're actually photographing clients, that's when you're making money versus sitting at the computer editing. So... It's having that awareness and trust that you can be supported and you don't have to do everything yourself. And as business owners, we have to remind ourselves that it takes a village to do anything, run a business, yes. raise a family. And you're right. We do think that we can do it best because we bootstrap, right? That's how most <laughs> businesses start. And, um, but then you really become a smart entrepreneur when you start to learn the ways in which you can outsource and make your time more efficient. Um, and I know that's what you do with 
yes. a lot of creatives. You you have some programs and intensives where you can help them get a little handle on their money. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? Sure. So I typically begin with a, uh, I call it a cash flow clarity intensive, where you can basically bring all your money stuff, your money documents, your debts, anything that ties to your financial systems. And I can come in and help you make smarter money moves by identifying how you could pay off your debt faster to save more, to quit your day job by figuring out how you can allocate money into an emergency fund, how to still take maternity leave and make sure that your business is still up and running, or help figure out when you can confidently bring more people on board and know that you have enough revenue coming in so that you can support them and support yourself. It's just looking at where those money leaks are and redirecting money so that it, you can reach your money goals faster. And once I know where you want to go, then it's really important to also look at your money story, to look at those different archetypes that were developed by Deborah Price at the Money Coaching Institute, which I'm trained in, where we go back to that first money memory. And then we look at how did your relationship with money become what it is today? It's not who you are, it's where you are, which means that it can change. Because if, if you're only equipped with strategies, but you don't have the awareness around which behaviors and beliefs and thought patterns around money that are sabotaging progress, it won't stick. In order to make your money story really change, you have to know which is causing the most tension and creating blocks that we can then shine a light on, figure out how you can change them in bite-sized ways to make them into something more empowering. And generally, it's around not having the head in the sand anymore, but actually take responsibility around looking at the reports, learning how to read them, and then outsourcing and feel confident that even if you have a bookkeeper taking care of your money systems, that you know how to get clarity from them and make sound decisions based on those reports. And to feel confident that you can pay yourself sustainably, your business is sustainable, you're taking care of your future self, those sorts of things. And that's something that, you know, doesn't change overnight. You you need both the the practical, strategic piece and the behavioral piece. And in the process, I also really teach my clients to tune into their intuition and learn how to trust themselves. And I do that both using tarot and my money compass deck that I developed as a way to connect with the energy of money so that you can start to tap internally for the answers. Um, there's so much external noise, but once you learn to trust yourself and feel confident in managing money, then you're unstoppable. That's how you stand in your power and you gain the autonomy and flexibility to live the life the way you want to and to have money flow with ease. Mm. That was so good, by the way, everything you just said. <laughs> I'm just like, okay, I want to look at my money as soon as we get off this call because I want to feel empowered with my money. And I love that you touched on intuition. You know, I love intuition. Yeah. There's so much access to information that a lot of people don't realize they have. Your money compass deck, I'm happy you brought that up because I have one of your decks that I love. Yeah. I use it often. Um, I have gotten, gotten out of practice a little bit, but I was doing it um, right before... I would do my bills 
So Mm -hmm. it was kind of like this nice little ritual that I would do to kind of get me grounded and just allow my intuition to talk to me like, okay, instead of feeling upset by paying bills, let's see what the message of money is this month. And maybe where do I need to focus my attention? Or maybe what do I need to pull back from? But I even use your deck with clients, especially I in love that. Way if they, yeah, if they are wanting to work on their money story or increasing their abundance, I have used your deck and I love it. And the message is always so beautiful. So I love your deck. I recommend it to everyone. Um, do you want to do a little card pull for the audience? I think that might be kind of fun. Sure. Yeah. And um, so just as a backstory to the deck, I developed it because I wanted there to be a tangible tool that you can have as an ally when you sit down and work on your money tasks. Because money is energy and In today's society, there's seldom do we actually hold physical money. We Mm. turned the energy of money into coins and bills so that we could exchange it for services and products. We used to then use our fingerprint, but now you you show your (laughs) face and you double click. And transactions go through so fast that you might have clicked before your brain has even had a chance to think about what you just purchased. So it's kind of an invitation to slow down and think of money as an energy you're partnering with. It's no different from a romantic relationship or a friendship or your relationship with time and your boundaries. If you can think of money as the neutral entity that it is, then you can make the relationship stronger. If you can set aside the emotions that you put on top of money, the negative things you say about money, the beliefs that you have inherited from someone else that talks negatively about money, if you learn to set all of those aside, and see money as an energy that wants to help you create the life you want and that it's there to co-create, then you can come into the space and ask the deck for guidance. So you ask either a how or a what question, kind of directing it either in terms of what does money need to thrive or what do you, you need to do in order to cultivate a stronger relationship. So there are 53 cards in the deck and they're all verbs, which means they're all actions. Some of them are being type actions and some of them are doing type actions. And I like to give rest as an example, that rest is an action. It's more in the being, but when we rest, we're able to solve problems more easily and with more clarity so there's both that feminine energy and the masculine energy and if you practice using the deck you're tapping into those archetypes that I use as a lens of strengthening the relationship you enhance the warrior energy that is the practical and more discerning around money And also the magician energy that taps into the trust and the compassion and the spiritual energy around money and this deep belief that more money will always flow to you. So the more you practice using the deck, the more you're spending time enhancing those positive archetypes instead of the innocent that wants to hide or the (laughs) the fool that wants to spend or the martyr who wants to take care of everyone else or the tyrant who says that there's never enough so it's a way to have a regular practice with money in a bite-sized way and i have also looked at it through the lens of uh, body mind and soul so the body being the practical way that we engage with money, the systems that you keep and the the mindset behavioral piece in how you think and speak around money. And then the soul piece in terms of how you do the work that you're meant to do that lights your 
your soul on fire and it all taps into your intuition and your trust in yourself and in the universe and kind of the glue that holds it all together is love because changing your relationship with money is not something that happens overnight it requires a lot of self-compassion a lot of self-love and a you know a tremendous belief in yourself that you have what it takes to change the story. Hmm. It is such a great tool. I mean, I'm kind of a collector of decks and I have to say this is definitely one of my favorite decks. So I'm excited for you, you to share a little bit with yeah. us today. Thank you. And um, <clears throat> I love how you can also use it in conjunction with tarot because tarot is a very powerful energetic tool as well and usually how I pair the two is that I'll pull a tarot card to kind of ask what energy am I working with and either it might be a challenging energy or it might be a really good energy and then I can pull a money compass deck card and say okay how can I move past this energy or how can I enhance this energy so you can even, you can use that as a tapping into the energy of a day, or you can tap into and ask, what is this unconscious block that I, I can sense it is there, but I can't verbalize it. So then you can pull a tarot card and it might be the five of pentacles with the lady that's walking outside in the cold and feeling kind of <laughs> as an outsider. And it's like, okay, well, how is that energy playing in in my life right now? And then I pull a compass card and see what I need to do to shift that energy. So it's it's fun to play with both of them. And, you know, as you say, the messages are always so on point. So the card that we got is forgive. I like that. You know, every day is a new day. and if you made money mistakes in the past, you can choose to forgive them and say the past was the past and you still have control over the future. I love that. That was a nice little yeah. wink for me. I started A Course in Miracles um, January 1st. And of course, you know, oh, fun. It's all about forgiveness. So that's my little God wink there for me, yeah. at least. So the guidebook reading goes release the tension cut the invis invisible cords forgive yourself it takes courage and humility to say i'm sorry do it for you write a letter and burn it what does your heart need let it go witness it being washed away in the tide forgiveness is a gift so forgiveness letters um that's a practice that I use with my clients too. And it's typically not something you send to a person. Sometimes it's that you have to forgive yourself, but sometimes it's also how a person made you feel. It might still have been wrong, but you're changing the, the way that you make that person or situation make you feel by forgiving it and letting it go. So I'm a big believer in releasing the energy. So either write it on a piece of toilet paper and then flush it. Like that physical release of just letting it go down the drain can be that clearing that you need or burning it or shredding it, which I think those are the three elements. Which, <laughs> which element are we missing? We have water, uh -huh. we have air through the shredding, fire, yeah. and earth. You can bury it, bury yes. it into the ground. And metal, you could cut it up with scissors. Oh, yes, yes. So oh, you, you can use Jenny. that into your intention. <laughs> God. There, has I to be, there has to be a release so that you can mm -hmm. put a stake in the ground that this is when things start to change. I don't think there was a more perfect card you could have pulled for today because when we opened the show about step one being awareness and maybe the first step is forgiveness, actually. Yeah, yeah. Is just forgiving, you know, 
those that have set you up with money beliefs or how you perceive they have and even yourself for some of your poor decisions with money a hundred percent i still think it's important to have the awareness to know what's going on and what blocks are causing the relationship with money to be the way it is but then you have a choice you can you can look at what are the positive behaviors i have around money and which ones are challenging so the positive ones you can honor them if they came from a parent or a grandparent or a teacher or from yourself uh, from your own lived experience and the challenging ones that's your opportunity to forgive it and to turn it into something more empowering beautiful jenny I'm so happy you came on today. This is so, this was fun. I think we went in so many different directions, but I don't even care. They were all so good. That was such a great conversation. And um, how can people find you? So you can go either to financialsforcreatives.com or you can go to moneycompassdeck.com. And I am pretty much every day on Instagram. So come and say hi in the DMs or, you know, if you, need help i recommend taking the money type quiz to get an idea of what your relationship with money is right now and which behaviors are dominating that relationship and if you need help to restructure your money and to put some strategies in place then the intensive might be something for you yeah It's all good. Everything you offer is so good. I'm so grateful to have worked with you and that you are part of my life because even though it's an ongoing commitment to changing, we've definitely set the ball in motion. So, um, yes, I I witness (laughs) your growth and, and I'm so thrilled and excited for you, Sarah, and what you have in store this year. You embody that drive and search for more alignment and what a gift that you're bringing that into people's homes i know you are tremendous uh help in me setting up my new office to to make it (laughs) feng shui approved and to get me into my power pose or power position and uh yes it's like those little energetic shifts they they make a big difference uh, to your confidence and your sense of calm. And that's also an awareness piece. There's a lot in our surroundings that we don't even pick up on, but we have to have clients like you to say, <laughs> hey, maybe you shouldn't have several doors behind your back. And uh... yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you for the work that you do. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Well, everybody go see Jenny. Thank you, Jenny. It was so fun. Thank you for having me. How cool is that, that we got the card forgive? I mean, we talk a lot about awareness being step one, but I really want to echo what I said during our conversation is that forgiveness is maybe step one, because when we forgive ourselves, whether it's around the way we've managed our money in the past or handled relationships or how we parent, It could be anything really, it doesn't matter. Forgiveness is what allows us to break free from the shackles of shame and guilt in any aspect of our life. And it gives us the opportunity then to really start new. So I hope you enjoyed today's episode. If you're interested in working more with Jenny or curious about her offerings, such as her cash flow intensive, visit her at financialsforcreatives.com. You can also connect with Jenny on Instagram at Financials for Creatives. This episode is so timely as Jenny is currently accepting scholarship applications for her program, Money Matters, a holistic wealth coaching program for creative entrepreneurs. This three-month program is valued at $52.50 and will provide clarity and confidence as you work on your relationship with money and provide you with more financial stability. The application deadline is April 24th, so be sure to get it in. I will provide all links to Jenny in the show notes, so be sure to check those out. Also, I'm offering to anyone who is ready to look at their money story through the lens of home 
the opportunity to work with me one-on-one at a discounted rate. This is for those who are exclusively looking to increase their wealth and abundance and prosperity. If you're interested, please visit me at jadescottdesign.com. As always, the direct link will be in the show notes. Until next time, my friends, much love and gratitude.